With a 50% obesity rate in the U.S. and more unhealthy people than ever before, it is time to make America healthy. Welcome to Make America Healthy with Beth Shaw. If you're feeling tired, toxic, heavy, slow, or stressed, then keep listening. Beth and her expert guests are here to offer practical advice and share the tools you need to reclaim your physical, mental, and emotional health. Now, here is your host, Beth Shaw. Welcome to Make America Healthy, where our goal is to empower you, inspire you, and educate you, giving you practical tools and tips so you can better take control of your own physical and mental health. And we've done so many different topics on this show, lots of mental health, obviously, lots of physical health. Today, we are talking about sexual health and sexual wellness. And we have two amazing guests on. We'd like to welcome Dr. Tara. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name back to the show. Dr. Tara is a relationship and sex expert, award-winning researcher, and a professor of sexual communication. She has her PhD in human communication, received tenure at age 33, and is a professor of relational and sexual communication at Cal State Fullerton. She also is a relationship coach at Love Bites and the host of the Love Bites podcast. And her TED Talk, How to Become Sexually Powerful, was very, very popular. And it highlighted her 5,000 participant study examining predictors of sexual satisfaction, her journey from an anxious immigrant from Thailand to a confident sex expert. We'd also like to welcome Verna Ming, Verna is an amazing entrepreneur that I actually know from Harvard Business School, and she is the founder and CEO of Blush, currently holding its place as one of the most recognized sexual wellness brands in the adult toy industry. And Verna takes pride in the Blush mission to enhance intimacy with thoughtful products designed to celebrate all bodies, genders, and sexual orientations. Welcome, ladies, to Make America Healthy. Dr. Tara, I'm going to open it up with you. You mentioned you have just gotten back from doing a reality show on sex and dating in London. And let's talk about what's going on around the world as it relates to sexual health and wellness. Hi, Beth. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so honored to be here also with Verna Blush just is an amazing company, so I'm excited to be here. I'm finally back in the sunshine here in Los Angeles. Uh, I was in London for a few months to film a show called Celebs Go Dating, where uh, I worked as a dating agent sex coach to six celebrities and then send them out uh, to go on dates and to engage in proper sexual communication. What I found uh, was that there are a lot of... uh, sex-related shows on mainstream media in the UK. Uh, Have you heard of Naked Attraction? I have not, but that sounds interesting. America brought it through HBO and it went number one, like the first day it released. And Naked Attraction is where the contestants get completely naked. And the main woman, it's like the bachelor or the bachelorette, looks at all the naked bodies without them talking and then select which one she likes the most or finds the most attractive. Is this for a long-term relationship situation or more of a casual encounter? Usually they go on a show wanting to be in a long-term relationship. So how important do you think, obviously physical attraction is very important. I find this, the premise of this show interesting. That's the number one criteria of which people are picking their potential mates. I'm not sure if it's their actually personal number one criteria. However, I think with this show, what they're trying to do is to reverse it a little bit because usually you don't see people naked until maybe a couple dates and you find there is sexual chemistry and then you want to have sex with them. With this show, they're just like, let's just get it over with. Here's a naked body. How do you feel about it? So to me, it's maybe not that person's like number one criteria but it's like a an interesting concept and I like the idea of normalizing naked bodies because I'm I'm a fan of nudity I think 
our body is a natural. There's nothing to be ashamed of, or it's a naked body isn't taboo. So for me, like that show coming to America was really cool. But on my show, Celebs Go Dating, where I coach celebrities, like the one thing that I found was that they were a lot more shy than I thought. Uh, I thought British women would be like, oh yeah, let's talk about sex. They weren't, oh my God, Tar, don't say that. There's a new thing that a lot of guys are trying. It's called pegging. Have you ever talked about that? And they're like, Tara, no, don't say that. <laughs> so it's really interesting how they're actually really shy to talk about it, which is different from my assumption at first. And most Europeans are pretty comfortable with nudity, which That's I'm assuming they're also comfortable with their bodies. So apparently other European, but not the English. <laughs> and, and let's jump over to the continent of Asia because you're both Asian. How is this? I've spent a lot of time in Japan. How does comfort with one's sexuality differ from culture to culture? I, I can contribute a little bit here. Our products are sold worldwide. So that means we do cover the Western and the Eastern culture. There's definitely differences in preference of the type of product that are needed in the Eastern culture. I would say in general, more men are buying sex toys. For yeah. the, themselves or their female partners? I, most, more, more for themselves, I would say. But those smaller percentage of female buyers in the Asian countries, they prefer something more of a cute type, adorable, pastel color, something that's just like more discreet type of product. So I would say the Asian culture still in general is more reserved, conservative than, than the Western culture some product type that are very popular in the Western culture it would not do well in the Eastern culture. Okay, great. Tara, you are a professor of sex at Cal State Fullerton. Can you share with our listeners historically how you think people viewing their bodies, sex positivity, how, how has that changed over the course of history here in the U.S.? Ooh, in the U.S., we have such short history. <laughs> I was going to go back to the Roman times. No, I, you know what? Go go there, girl. Go back to really, the Roman times. Really, back in the ancient Greek and Roman time, sex positivity was a lot more common and gender neutrality was a lot more common. Back in the days, a male and a male having sexual relations wasn't as taboo as, let's say, when the rise of Christianity and other organized religion came in. So there was some sex positivity a long time ago, thousands of years ago during the Roman and Greek time. But then comes organized religion like Christianity, Islam, and other organized religion that teaches gender roles and the role of sexual relationship within a relationship that it's between a male and a female within a marriage. With that teaching in which we call overall a purity culture, uh, and in which now hundreds of research have found to be quite toxic, have moved into now we can jump to America. So it has moved around the world. And it has moved into uh, all of the European countries, as well as like the African countries. The Middle East have like their own majority uh, religion that also has very strict teaching around that. Asia, even though the majority religion is Buddhism, it's still a very conservative, sexually conservative region. So overall, we turn from that into a quite sex sexually conservative for a long time. In America, during the 60s, we had the free love movement <coughs> that was also going around with other things like fun music festivals, but also acid <laughs> and these other things where freedom and free love became a little bit more normalized, however, still stigmatized because there's the majority of the people and then there's the quote unquote free love people where the majority still look down on these people. Oh, they just do drugs and have sex. But th there was a lot of feminist, the second round of feminist writings about female pleasure. So for my own work, I didn't study like politics or anything like I studied sex. So I only looked at that and uh, writing about female pleasure for some of the very first times was very controversial because for the longest time, we only talk about male pleasure. Uh -huh. So talking about female pleasure uh, in the 60s and then onwards was a huge 
huge platform to move towards sex positivity right now. Without those people doing the work early on in the 60s, we wouldn't be here, me as a, an immigrant woman, going on uh, a website, buy five vibrators and maybe a butt plug for myself, have it shipped to my house and enjoy it and tell my friends. Without those people doing the really hard work early on, we wouldn't have the freedom of sexuality today in America, because I can't say other places <laughs> in America. I'm, I'm uh, grateful for the people that worked for sex positivity early on. So do you think we're at the most free place that we've been in the U.S. historically now? Yes. Okay. And for individuals who perhaps grew up in a religious household or have a lot of societal conditioning, also trying to find within that their own path to sexual freedom, as a sex expert and professor, I've been a practitioner of yoga since childhood, which has its roots in the Hindu religion. In that thought process, like sharing your energy with too many people is not looked upon favorably, strictly from a more spiritual energetic standpoint. So how do you help people and counsel them to find their own path amidst a lot of societal programming, a lot of religious programming, and then also find their own way of freedom? Is there a particular process, other than, of course, experimenting, that one should undergo? Or how do you advise people to become sexually liberated for themselves, whether that is a monogamous relationship or something like polyamory. I was going to say, get a vibrator. As uh, someone who grew up and w was raised by very religious parents, we went to the temple every Sunday and we prayed every day, meditated every day. Uh, and I actually was introduced to the concept of yoga and stillness and breath work since I was young because I grew up uh, as a Buddhist. Right. Uh, and I'm still a practicing Buddhist uh, now. So when I counsel my students, my followers, or my clients who grew up in a very religious context and very sexually conservative context, how to cross over onto their own lane of sexual empowerment and whatever it looks like for them, because what it looks like for me and for them can be different, and that's okay. I usually counsel them that being someone of that have faith and being a sexually empowered woman or person is not mutually exclusive. You can be both. Uh, I wake up and pray every morning, but then in the afternoon, if I want to grab a vibrator and have a little masturbation session, I can. So to me, I show them by examples. Here are some of the practices that I do. I can go to the temple, but then come back and talk to my partner about what it's like for us to be monogamish or to go to a sex party. So I always tell people that it can 100% coexist if you allow it to. Now, I'm only speaking as a woman that has a lot of freedom who lives in Los Angeles. I'm very privileged. Women around the world don't have this right. There are places where you still have to wear head coverings and you get beat if you don't. I, I can't say for around the world, but if you're in the United States and you live in the cities, you definitely have the choice to choose certain practices from your faith that's healthy for you. For me, it's meditation and praying. Connect to the higher being. And then the rest that are a little bit more oppressive for women, I don't take. Give it back. <laughs> then I also practice my own sexual mindfulness journey. And that can be mindful masturbation because giving pleasure to yourself is very empowering. Uh, I talk to women of all ages that have never masturbated. I have talked to women in their 60s that have never masturbated. Sometimes I introduce them to these different toys that help them masturbate like, easier than using their fingers. And they're like, Tara, oh my God. And I say, yeah, isn't that nice? Sexual repression obviously takes its toll on a society and on women in particular. I'd like to open this question up to both of you. Do you feel like the rules for men and women are still different? That women are expected to be nice, proper ladies? How do you see these rules as misogyny and what 
have you seen with women who get their sexual liberation on, whatever that looks like to them? I'm going to jump in here. I think it, it is still very different. I think there is still a lot of inequalities in definition of sex, um, sexual freedom or concept of sexual freedom for men and women in many places in the world. Uh, I really agree with what Tara said, being somebody who is in Los Angeles and have all the freedom that you want. Yes, we are very privileged. I live in New York myself. I am a world traveler, just like the two of you. And I'm sure you, you do agree with me. Just take the type of the sexual wellness product as example. In many Muslim countries or any some other countries in the world, this product is illegal. It's like illegal for me to go and open a company or try to sell to that region of the world. I've heard stories like how women will go out of their way or men will go out of their way to smuggle toys in, into the country where it's prohibited, where it's banned. Why do you think it's banned? Is it banned for religious purposes or is it banned to keep women, uh, I don't know, can you control women by repressing them sexually? I think I mentioned the Muslim countries. Uh, that's what I know. I'm sure there are other reasons, but I think it's mainly for religious reason. In some countries like Iran or Saudi Arabia, women have to cover themselves up. And I've been to Abu Dhabi and people want women walk around covering themselves up. I think it's double standard, like in my opinion. So I, I don't think in those places in the world that women uh, are encouraged to really express themselves or please themselves. I've been to Japan recently, a couple of months ago, and one of the major business network association. They don't have one single female member. It's not allowed. I'm sitting on the table with other male entrepreneurs in Japan. And just by cracking a small joke, oh, that's kind of odd. Let's change that. I got a dirty look right on the same table. So I think there's still a lot of inequalities. Thank you, Verna. And Dr. Tara, how does that impact a society as a whole? And how does that impact the individual to be sexually repressed? Oh, gosh, I think the individual impact and the societal impact is one in the same is when people are not fulfilled in their sexuality, it can project negatively in other aspects of life. We know that people who are sexually repressed and, se and or sexually frustrated don't perform well in school, at work, probably not a great friend because they are frustrated, not a great daughter or son. When we're thinking of a more peaceful society where people are thriving in their own ways and flourishing in whatever they want to do, we can't skip, we cannot skip sexual wellness. It's a part of who we are. Well, so, yeah, it's a part of being in the human body. Exactly. Exactly. It's also a part of why we're all here. It's a very important part to how we're here. To me, it causes a lot of negative effects in the individual as well as at the societal level in which it's time for us to try to move towards more sex positivity for all. We also have to talk about equality and equity when it comes to sex positivity because like we said before, both Verna and I acknowledge like we can't all have sex positivity. I can because I'm a woman. I have higher education. I have an understanding husband and I live in Los Angeles. But then there's so many other women around the world that still couldn't and men. It's I don't think that the society it's at its peak flourishing and functioning until we can all experience at a level that we prefer a sexual wellness. Thank you for that, Dr. Tara. I saw a movie, I think it was, and I've read some articles, I think back maybe in the 1930s, 40s, or, or 50s, and I'm sure Verna will know this, doctors would treat women for hysteria and mental health issues using various sexual gadgets. Is that correct? Yes. But back in the days, it wasn't conceptualized as sexual gadgets became sexual gadgets later. They were treating for migraines, hysteria, yeah. mental health issues. 
Yeah, they were using mainly a huge vibrator for all kinds of things for women. And how? Why did this practice go away? I like that question, Beth. I wonder the same. <laughs> I think because a lot of times when you observe the medical field, they themselves have gone through this becoming more conservative, becoming more sex positive. They also had their own journey. A lot of doctors were not, I would say most of doctors, because I interview a doctor and she was like, oh yeah, I was not trained in how to talk about sexual wellness or sexual behavior. So even nowadays, majority of the doctors were not trained to talk about sex. They're not trained in nutrition either. And nutrition and sex, I feel like, are very, very important human foundation. Yes, very Uh, much so. Yeah, the fact that there was that treatment and then the medical association come together and go, you know, let's ban that. That's like giving women more pleasure or whatever. Let's not do that. Now they give you a pill that probably prevents you from getting sexually aroused or being able to complete the journey, right? A lot of SSRIs and all of that. Yeah, it's gone completely in the opposite direction. It's very scary. And I've seen these studies that show a significantly lower sexual desire, sexual response, sexual arousal, vaginal lubrication, all the things. And yet- If our listeners are listening, other than getting some of Verna's fabulous blush products- I'll tell you a funny yoga story I have with one of them a little bit later in the show. But other than getting one of Verna's products, what do you recommend in, in ter- when people are looking at, I'm having a mood disorder, I'm having depression, might the cure be a little bit more sexual wellness? Depends on which doctor you ask. Well, I'm, not, I, I'm asking you, Dr. Tara. <laughs> For me, yes. Uh, because if you look at the science of sexual health and pleasure what we find is when we have meaningful physical contact there is release of oxytocin dopamine and serotonin serotonin being the pill that a lot of women are ta- a lot of people are taking but with meaningful physical contact and particularly orgasms we see a spike of oxytocin dopamine and serotonin So if you're having a meaningful, mindful sexual encounter with your partner, one can say scientifically, it looks similarly to having a dose of a happy pill. And I'm sure they've done clinical trials, brain scans, and all of this to be able to to prove this to be true. Yeah, it is like what we learn in the first year of the PhD program. Sex is great. There's not just partnered sex, but self-pleasure as well, because when you orgasm alone, it's the same. I, I like that you said meaningful connection, because I have a lot of friends that have teenage children in college, and it seems like there's uh, less relationships these days and more hooking up. If it's just a a very casual encounter, are you still getting the same levels of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, or oxytocin? Are you still getting that same hit or is it proven to be different? There's no proof. So I can't say with certainty. However, I think a lot Mm -hmm. of uh, casual sex studies have a lot more outcomes that are related to psychological outcomes. So if you're engaging in one, let's say, casual sex encounter that you really want to and you engage in in mindfully, maybe a friend would benefit. Maybe you also have a funny conversation, a deep conversation or whatever. You get positive psychological benefits from this type of relationship, then it can be good. However, what we're seeing is mindless hookups. So that's a different story, right? Mindless hookups don't necessarily yield similar positive effects that a mindful sexual encounter has. Verna, would you like to weigh in on this? Here's my personal opinion. I don't have a doctor degree in sexual wellness. However, I would say I do. we are the manufacturer and designer of the product that we make. And our mission is to bring pleasure into the lives of people. It defines someone that plays sexual sex toys is somebody that truly loves him him or herself and, and value the lifestyle. 
that he or she owns. Every kind of sexual activity does bring a lot of physical pleasure to the body, which enhances mental health as well. But if we really want to define a, a, a meaningful relationship, I think it probably at the same time, it, it helps with not only bringing the, sex, the physical satisfaction, but as well as mental satisfaction. And often for couples, it does enhance relationship, marital relationship or intimate relationship and make this person in general a much happier person, a more productive person. Then while at the same time, if it's someone that's just playing the toys or having a sexual activity on his or her own, then this is a very empowering way of bring pleasure to oneself. I think either way, it's empowering, it's satisfying, and it's pleasurable. So that's, that's my personal. That's, that's awesome. And, and in a world that's increasingly hostile, combative, and fearful, I think that any healthy ways for people to get pleasure at this point are good enough. Bern, I'd also like to mention you have a, a variety of products, including Kegel Balls, which I have actually used during yoga practice to engage Mula Bandha, which is supposed to increase the energy flow throughout the entire body. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the more obscure products that you offer that are, are just really good for not just sexual wellness, but also bladder control issues and other things, Kegel balls, jade eggs, things of those nature that I think are also very Asian in their orientation. A correction to that is that our product is not specifically designed for a particular region. However, uh, you mentioned one of our favorite product, the Kegel ball set, um, that actually is very popular in both um, Western and, and Eastern uh, countries in our market right now. Yes, it does bring a lot of benefits, especially, specifically the Kegel ball. It does act, help exercise the, the muscles around the vaginal area. For people who really put in the effort to use it, I think it's like a regular exercise. It's like a yoga routine. It's like a jogging in the park. It's like something you do in a regular basis and that's part of your life. So I saw something on Instagram where a woman actually attached some weights to some Kegel balls and was lifting weights with that muscle group. That was something really different. I do a lot of working out clearly, but that is not part of my routine, but it's it, apparently Dr. Tara, they even said that the women didn't need Botox after they were doing those exercises. Any thoughts or comments on that? I'm thinking about the same woman. She got famous from the ability to lift a surfboard. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if there's scientific research to to back up like that rigorous type of exercise. <laughs> However, with Kegel's exercises, we know that it's highly beneficial. So to use the same assumption, why wouldn't it be why wouldn't it be to grow it stronger and stronger? The fact that it has positive effects elsewhere like skin and her mood. I'm always happy and I believe it. <laughs> I think that there's so much so much down there that can contribute to the whole body and the whole and probably much like the brain there's a lot that just hasn't been researched yet right yeah so much we don't know much at all great um as we move towards the close of the show i'm going to open this up to both of you if you would just like to give our listeners some sexual wellness tips other than of course practicing safe sex no matter what you're doing we'd love to hear that how to be fully expressed and but healthy at the same time during the time of COVID, the demand for sexual wellness product increased tremendously around the world. And I think we all know the reason why, you know, when everyone's trapped indoor, they were turning to sex toys to get help to enhance the life that they have to spend at home indoor. I think that was an opportunity for our industry, but then also at the same time for the people who never had the opportunity to learn about what sex toys can bring to them. It's a safe way. It's an inexpensive way to have pleasure at home instead of going out there and get exposed with the yeah. potential disease, danger, risk, all kinds of stuff. I think that's all I have to say about that. You know, The tip 
my tip will be like, let's give yourself an opportunity to get introduced to the world of sex toys and find pleasures with it and awesome. change your lifestyle. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Verna. Dr. Tara. Verna, I'm a big fan of sex toys. Uh, I definitely support that comment because sex toys is good for self, like self-pleasure, but also partnered pleasure. There's also toys that um, allow you to connect with your partner. From myself, I would say uh, it's split into two aspects. One is yourself and two is you and your partner. So first for yourself, I highly recommend everybody try sexual meditation. Sexual meditation is similar to a regular meditation practice, but it focuses on sexual thoughts, sexual feelings, and sensations in your body. If you can do it quietly, you can think of a time where you had a passionate sexual encounter and uh, do breath work along the way while thinking about that encounter. If you want guided meditation, I have a free guided sexual meditation on YouTube if you just search uh, my name. There's research from around the world, but particularly University of British Columbia, that found significant positive effects in sexual response, sexual arousal, sexual desire for uh, particularly women that engage in sexual mindfulness practices like meditation. Uh, so I highly recommend that for the self. For you and your partner, I highly recommend sexy check-in. Do this once a month or maybe once every quarter. And it can be a question, how has our sex life been for you? What are some of the things that you think we can do to improve it? And what are some of the things that you think I can do to improve my sexual wellness and our sexual wellness? I think through these three discussion questions, you will have a much better sex life together. Wonderful. We're going to leave it there. I would like to thank you both so much. This has been a very enlightening show and certainly an interesting topic. We'd like to thank our sponsors Yoga Fit Training Systems Worldwide, the leader in yoga mind body education, hosting conferences, trainings, corporate wellness, online classes, and so much more. Visit yogafit at yogafit.com and you can save 15% uh, at checkout by using the code HEALTHY23. And we would also like to thank our new sponsor, Blush. Verna's company, Blush is a sexual health brand committed to the pursuit of pleasure with innovation, education, and they make amazing products that celebrate intimacy with thoughtful designs that celebrate all bodies. They have a great wellness collection. It has a variety of men's and women's products. They have Kegel balls and massagers and all different types of things. So you could go to blushvibe.com. Thank you again to our sponsor, Blush. Let's celebrate women's sexual health and men's sexual health with blush products. Listeners, if you enjoyed this show and know someone who needs to hear it, please share. And we will see you again on another episode of Make America Healthy. Together, we can do this on every level. Let's get healthy. Namaste. Thanks for joining us on Make America Healthy. We hope we've given you some tools you need to take back control of your health. Until next time, we wish you a healthy and wonderful week.